Hello and welcome to my channel Cyber Hashira. I wish you all a very happy new year. I hope you all get treated with good things and I will do my best to make many useful videos for you all. So in this video, my first video for 2023, I'll be talking about Libra SSL and Boring SSL. Now these are folks that derive from OpenSSL. They all have their own use case and I'll explain each of them in this video. Let's begin. I will begin by first explaining what a fork is. A fork is simply a copy of a code from an existing project code. Making a fork of a project means that an exact copy of that project's code has been copied under your account. So now you're free to do whatever you want with that code. The changes that you make to your own forked code does not affect the original code. It is as if you borrowed a piece of code from your friend and then started working on that code without affecting your friend's code at all. Fork is a useful feature when you want to develop something new out of an existing code. The foundational code of the project already exists and all you need to do is make changes to that code. Just imagine that there is a, a, a popular open source program and you are in no way associated with the development of that program and you believe that you can improve that program, make it even better, or uh, maybe even add some new features to it. Well, you could simply fork that program code onto your own account, like from GitHub, and then take it from there. Making a fork of a project is useful as it saves time when you want to write an application. Now, depending on what you want to write, most of the code is already there, and all you need to do is make changes to it, therefore saving some development time. Before I start talking about LibreSSL and BoringSSL, I think I should first talk about some of the problems that exist in OpenSSL. From what I've researched and read, there is just one problem with it, the code itself. Now, OpenSSL is a big project and it has at least half a million lines of code. And those who are from development background may already know that more code you have in your program the harder it becomes to troubleshoot or fix problems with it. And depending on the type of bugs found in the code, the effort to fix that code will also increase. There's also increased effort to test and audit that code. The likelihood for security vulnerabilities also increases and the application becomes bloated. It takes more time to build. Such is the case with OpenSSL. Let me show you something. Now, here's a list of all vulnerabilities that were discovered in OpenSSL libraries since uh, 1999. You can clearly see the number of vulnerabilities discovered for each year. In 2022 al alone, there were like 13 vulnerabilities. Two of them were like high severity vulnerabilities. I'll, I'll show you what they were. Uh, you can also see the type of vulnerabilities that were found. Now, out of uh, 219 vulnerabilities, 117 vulnerabilities were related to uh, denial of service. I mean, if uh, if those vulnerabilities were exploited, it could result in denial of services. Other types of uh, vulnerabilities include bypass vulnerabilities, uh, code execution, and some other memory related uh, vulnerabilities. Now, let me show you what this data looks like for Libra SSL and Boring SSL. So this is for Open SSL. This is for Libra SSL. Uh, the library started, I mean, Libra SSL started in 2014. And uh, these are the number of vulnerabilities that were discovered. And this is for Boring SSL. Only one vulnerability discovered that was in 2018. And this page, uh, this is from the OpenSSL's uh, uh, website. So this is the vulnerability section of uh, OpenSSL. Uh, they also maintain uh, the record of all um, vulnerabilities that were discovered. So in 2022, as I said, uh, so these are the two uh, high severity vulnerabilities that were discovered uh, in November, in the month of November. And OpenSSL recommended using OpenSSL 3.0.7 to fix these vulnerabilities. So these are the two vulnerabilities. 
Now, I'm not saying that the code for OpenSSL is so bad that it resulted in uh, so many vulnerabilities. But yes, some of the coding bad practices did result in security issues with their library. Another reason why OpenSSL has so many vulnerabilities could be because of its uh, popularities. I mean, just look at this. I mean, it has been used widely for so many years, for over a decade, no, over two decades. And it's obvious that someone would discover a bug or fault in its uh, implementation. Also, OpenSSL is open source, so anyone can look at their code and see what's going on in it. The first OpenSSL fork I'm going to talk about in this video is LibreSSL. LibreSSL project was started by OpenBSD as a fork for OpenSSL 1.0.1G in 2014. This project started after a vulnerability called Heartbleed was found in OpenSSL's library. At the time when this vulnerability was made public, OpenSSL was being used on so many web servers and programs. OpenSSL was rather quick to publish a patch for this Heartbleed, uh, heartbleed vulnerability. After what happened, OpenBSD decided to write their own SSL TLS implementation and that's how LibreSSL project started. The main aim of LibreSSL is to improve the security of its uh, cryptographic library and modernize the code. Now the way uh, LibreSSL was able to optimize its code was by making sure that it has a cleaner code base. They implemented best practices in programming wherever it was required. As per uh, Wikipedia, during the development phase, LibreSSL removed more than 90,000 lines of C code from the forked OpenSSL code. They removed the heartbeat feature of OpenSSL, which actually caused the heartbleed vulnerability. They removed uh, support for obsolete operating systems and platform along with uh, some other unused code found in OpenSSL. They also removed support for old compilers along with support for SSL 3.0 and fixed many bugs in OpenSSL which had remained open for quite some time. The benefit of doing all this is lesser code. Lesser code means less number of bugs. It's now easier to test the code and fix bugs. Likelihood for vulnerabilities decreased. The code became less complex, making it easier to understand. The code wasn't bloated anymore, and the code had better security. LibreSSL API is also easier to understand and use compared to OpenSSL. At present, OpenBSD still uses LibreSSL as the primary cryptographic provider. Uh, there were also some Linux distributions which were using LibreSSL library, but later they decided to drop support for it. For example, Alpine, Gintu, and Void Linux dropped support for uh, LibreSSL in the year 2021. Now, one of the main reasons why these distributions dropped support was because LibreSSL lacked FIPS compliance. LibreSSL does not have any FIPS compliant library, also known as FIPS module. OpenSSL has its own FIPS module, which is also FIPS certified. Um, there were also some widely used programs that still uses OpenSSL library, and LibreSSL just couldn't remain compatible with those programs. And I should also mention that OpenSSL library has improved quite a lot since uh, 2014, and despite all its flaws, OpenSSL still remains the most widely used TLS implementation. The next fork I'm going to talk about is called Boring SSL. Just like LibreSSL, Boring SSL also started when Heartbleed vulnerability was first discovered. This project is led by Google and it started in the month of June 2014. Boring SSL is open source, however, Google does not recommend using it for general purpose. The reason being, Google made Boring SSL so they could use it with their own products such as Chrome and Android. Now, before uh, Google started using uh, Boring SSL, they were using OpenSSL for quite some time, which eventually they had to stop because maintaining a growing list of OpenSSL patches became a complex task for them. And that's all I have for you in this short video. I hope you found it informative. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you're new here. I'll hopefully see you soon in the next one. Bye bye.